Hello and welcome back to this um, hugely vital discussion, really, on how the ongoing and ever-changing global vaccination process will, will contribute to restore trust and a sense of security to restart travel and tourism. Um, it goes without saying that having the most precise and informed appreciation of the health issues and the way um, out of the pandemic is critical in investment decisions, which is ultimately this conference is about. So there is a reason for this. It's, it's absolutely crucial that we get vaccinations sorted. And I'm sure, as Taleb says, there is a need for a multilateral response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I'm going to just throw in one fact here before we get to the panel, which is that apparently 70% of people in the West have been vaccinated. And in the least developed countries, it's 3%. That it's an incredible difference that we obviously all have to address. So, as Paul said, we have um, online, or virtually, we have uh, Elena Kuntura, who is the member of the European Parliament and formerly Minister of Tourism in Greece. Welcome. We have uh, Cuthbert, thank you, Elena. Uh, we have Cuthbert in Kube, Executive Chairman of the African Tourism Board as well. We have Taleb, who you all know here too. And I want to bring on, first of all, um, Dennis Kinane, founder and chief medical officer of Scene Post Diagnostics UK. If you'd like to come here, Dennis, because you're doing a, a bit of a presentation, aren't you? Okay. Is the slides change automatically? Or is it? Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> we are at Scene Post Diagnostics um, totally focused on diagnostics, as you'd imagine, and particularly in this situation, we're focused on diagnosing uh, COVID. And actually, by doing this, we've been able to um, allow companies to get back to work. And in addition to that, we've been able to test for uh, the travel industry and allow borders to open up a little uh, more so than they have. We've been somewhat hampered by this, uh, as you can imagine, by the constant changes in the uh, instructions given by various countries and the lack of information to individuals, etc. And in addition to that, um, the legislation changes from one country to the next. But despite this, uh, we've probably done about 3 million tests, probably about 500,000 in keeping businesses like um, the sports businesses, um, the PGA, one of them, we're just doing the All Blacks just uh, recently. But in addition to that, we've done large banks and also defence contractors, etc. So we've been actually allowing people to get back and working during the period. Recently, we've been greatly helped by the fact we've actually had vaccination and a high level of vaccination in the country. And in the other countries that we're working in, then we've had similar scenarios whereby the vaccination has allowed us to, um, let's say, be fairly confident that people can get back in a, a better way but we still are aware that even with vaccination, we still have a problem with respect to catching COVID and passing it on. This idea of herd immunity is, is an elusive concept that will never be realized. We'll never get herd immunity in the true sense. We'll never get enough trees in the forest knocked down so that a fire can't ravish through the forest. People who are vaccinated will still get COVID and they'll still pass it on. But as the, the subject of today's um, meetings about is how do we actually get vaccinations to those who are uh, less economically powerful and the countries that desperately need it and ones that we really should be and we morally should be doing something about and it's not just moral for our own sake but it's moral for everybody else included including ourselves in the sense that we will be in a scenario in that point where we will be getting control of COVID rather than actually waiting for the next variant to come in from another country that we probably could have done something to reduce vaccination. So I should say something more positive about vaccination and tell you that vaccination is going to be critical, even although vaccination doesn't necessarily stop you catching it and transmitting it, it does increase the decrease the chances that you will do so. So it is effective in that. So I don't want you to get the impression that it's not in itself effective as a means of actually reducing COVID. But what it really is important is making sure that much less people die of COVID. So, so we are across the world. Um, on Thursday, I'm heading off to the States. We're actually opening up um, for some of our partners, Netflix and Amazon and other, other companies that are doing movies. So we do a lot of the movie sets. 
And um, <clears throat> it's very interesting that they're asking a British company to come over and test in the United States. You think that they probably had that already, um, you know, but uh, the companies that we've been working with have been really pleased about what we're doing and how we approach things, and they've asked us to come and they give, we give them a sense of confidence. Uh, so we're around the world, but we're predominantly in the UK and we're coming out of the UK. We have 200 scientists at the moment. We're continuing to um, push them away from a lot of the COVID testing we're currently doing. And we're looking in the future to pick up on uh, other diagnostics that have been put by the wayside. So we've had 5 million dead from COVID so far directly. And we probably had another 5 million at least globally who've died from COVID because they didn't get the necessary treatment they should have got. And um, we just heard from Raja and the statistics in terms of the developed and uh, you know the the, uh, the the rich countries in terms of their COVID vaccination status compared to the uh, poorer countries, and we'll expect that, uh, given those statistics, that we'll expect a lot more deaths in the future from those countries rather than from the rich um, countries. So, uh, so as I say, we, we're across the UK. We're actually this is just showing. Um, a small sna snapshot of where we are. And a lot of the places we are is, is in order that we can actually deal with the travel industry. So we're, we're Heathrow, obviously, we're, we're big at Heathrow, we're big in Gatwick, Edinburgh, Manchester, Birmingham, etc. But we're also in uh, lots of other areas that are not on this map, such as we're in Limerick and in Dublin also. I, I'm only saying that because genetically I'm Irish and I've got to, my mum and dad would be really pleased if I kept mentioning Ireland as much as possible. So. That was a small attempt at a joke, but I'm not going to try anymore. <laughs> no, don't, don't. I thought I'd get the sympathy clap there. Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so we're fast, affordable, reliable. This is just telling you how great we are, so you don't need to read that. Um, but essentially, uh, what I would say is that we have, we've been really proud in the sense that with our doctor service and our virology panel that we company the whole diagnostics with, we're actually being able to prevent any in-house transmission. So that gives the companies, the film industry, the leading actors and all the rest of it, or the dancers and Strictly, for example, confidence that they're not going to pass it on. So we, what we like to say is we, with our uh, PCR testing, we're able to take the fox out of the hen house before it does any damage. And uh, believe me, there are a lot of foxes out there. And when it gets to sport, it's uh, you know absolutely incredible. So anyway, to move on there and just to say that um, we are committed to supporting uh, travel, but we're also committed to supporting this venture of actually trying to make people aware that if we do not vaccinate the rest of the world in the same way as we're vaccinating the richer countries, then we'll be in a situation where uh, we'll continue to have COVID and new variants will keep coming back and we won't really get on top of this. So we've got to do, uh, we've got to help other countries for moral reasons, but also for protection of ourselves. I'd like to um, leave it at that now and uh, sit down. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dennis. Um, if I can turn possibly to you, uh, Cuthbert, first, um, Executive Chairman, Africa Tourism Board, in terms of um, the vaccination rate there. I mean, the rebound of the tourism industry in Africa absolutely depends, uh, doesn't it, on a large extent of the rate of vaccination there. Um, can you give me give us all an idea of, of the rate of vaccination in different parts of Africa um, and how the, the, the vaccination campaign can be accelerated there, please? Um, I'm just saying that the rebound of the tourism industry in Africa obviously depends hugely on uh, vaccination rates going up. Could you give us enough, an idea roughly of what that rate is across Africa and how vaccinations can be accelerated there? Thank you so much. I would appreciate to acknowledge our ministers who are with us and uh, Dr. Taleb. Uh, we really appreciate and uh, this is an indication that uh, our tourism sector is now bouncing back. Hence, we are able to meet physically in our beautiful, lovely England. Yes, thank you so much. Look, uh, firstly, there is a need to incorporate an aggressive recovery plan to reverse the lost gains in disease control efforts and put African countries back on its course towards achieving the global targets. 
We have noted actually with so much disappointment that um, it, it, we haven't seen a well coordinated approach in terms of uh, vaccine rollout. And also, we have noted the exclusion of the African continent. We have heard so much about uh, globalization that the world has become a global community. But it hasn't been the case. We have seen the exclusion of Africa, especially we have experienced that during the, uh, this unfortunate pandemic where each and everyone was left to fend for himself. And also in Africa, we have experienced a disjointment among us, the member states in rolling out the vaccination, yes, and in creating mechanisms on how do we as a block of nations try to work together so that we are able to control uh, the unfortunate situation we find ourselves in. We have always relied on external forces to assist us with uh, giving us vaccine. So our, our, our advocacy is to say, how do we regroup as the African continent so that we create our own mechanisms so that we are able to work together one in containing the, 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 the pandemic and also in creating mechanisms of developing our own vaccines. I'm sure that's the best way to go. But unfortunately, also we're looking at Africa as um, we did not see much of an aggressive pandemic in Africa. We, we have always said Africa has been spared by God's hand because we did not experience what the other continents has experienced. And also I can allude to some of our African countries who did not even go to the extent of locking down their economies and they are still standing now. We have seen a growth, I can name Tanzania, where during the COVID-19, where everybody was crying, they experienced a three or six percent growth in their economy. So as African Tourism Board, we are advocating that, look, Africa should definitely go back to its drawing board and then we start working together as a block and also pleading with the global community that you cannot solve as much as we are saying we're a global community, but you cannot actually solve issues and sideline one of your own within that global community because at the end of the day, all the efforts you are doing, it they will definitely have, I mean, a negative impact, setbacks. E.g., we, we have seen most of the countries actually uh, closing their borders to Africa, I mean, uh, labeling some of the African countries as red zones uh, where flights were, 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 were actually stopped. So we are saying, look, it, it, it has to be a cohesive approach because it is a global pandemic. It is a global problem we are facing. But yes, as Africa, we are saying, I would allude also with uh, Minister Balala and uh, Minister uh, from uh, Botswana, who have said, look, Africa, it's, it's, we are ready for investment. And Africa has so much to offer. And I have always said, um, Africa has been able to shield and carry some of our, I mean, um, uh, advanced countries, continents, to the extent that uh, we have sustained them, and Africa is able to sustain itself only if we really need to work together as a team, as a block, so that we are able as well to be appreciated. I believe that Africa is the next jewel of the world in terms of investment and also in terms of tourists, in terms of business travel, because we have so much to offer and so much to be explored within the investment um, I mean, uh, parameters. So yes, we are ready, and there's a lot of, of, of opportunities in Africa. If, if I could just return to the, sorry, can you hear me all right? Yeah, if I can just return to the um, rate of vaccination, across Africa, obviously it differs from, from country to country, but what is it on average, would you say? Look, on average, we're looking at, um, I was in Tanzania a few days ago, where we have seen a very good turnout in terms of vaccination, and we, we, we're glad that most of our people, they've realized uh, and appreciated 
the efforts that are actually being put in place. And uh, I was in Ethiopia as well, so some in, same story, where we now see an appreciation uh, of the vaccine rollout, and uh, we're looking at 50, 45% of our populace who are actually getting vaccinated. Okay. And you still have pockets. You still have pockets who still believe otherwise that look, uh, I mean, a, a narrative that these vaccines are not safe for human consumption. But yes, we are encouraging our populace, we are encouraging everybody to get vaccinated so that we can really activate our economies to the fullest. Now, obviously, the, the vaccination process isn't just a one-off, though, is it? It's obviously going to be an ongoing situation where you're going to need boosters, you're going to keep going. So in ter you mentioned this, um, Cuthbert, in terms of actually having a plant or plants in Africa making the vaccine, how, how possible is that? Look, if we could have a cohesive approach, as I indicated, if we could have a well-coordinated approach with one purpose in mind for all the policymakers to say how best then can we, instead of the dependence syndrome where we depend on exterior forces to supply vaccines to help us in Africa, we say let us stand, let us appreciate, and let us in our own, in our own terms. That yes, it, it, it's, I, I, I agree with you that I think I can take the first uh, jab, and I, I still have to go and get my second jab. And there are people looking for boosters from time. So these are the big comments, and it requires us to stand up and start their own pharmaceutical companies so that we are able to supply our populace, so that we are able to actually I mean, in, I mean, in, in vaccinate as many of our people as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, Elena, you're, I think you're in Brussels, aren't you? The, the, the EU home, and the EU, I think, promised that it would be distributing uh, vaccinations to uh, the countries in Africa, for example. What, what, what's, it, what, what's the situation at the moment? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me in such a very interesting uh, panel and conversation. Um, to be honest, uh, the European Parliament, since last June, in an historical vote, uh, asked from the Commission for a firm decision on waiving intellectual property rights for coronavirus-related products, including vaccines, at the World Trade Organization aiming to address global production uh, constraints and su uh, supply shortcuts. And in another uh, resolution, last month, we called for more transparency in the development, uh, purchase and uh, distribution of COVID vaccines. Uh, I think the COVAX initiative is very important. Uh, the World Health Organization COVID-19 Technology Access Pool C uh, 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 tap in the cross-border supply of materials needed for vaccine production and as well its strategy for increased uh, production capacity and criteria for those distribution between countries. Uh, and, and at the same time, we called on the European Commission to provide strong safeguards for uh, accessible and affordable COVID-19 vaccines when uh, signing future contracts with uh, pharmaceutical companies considering clauses related to intellectual properties, rights and uh, non-exclusive license prices and best efforts to enhance production and distribution of uh, vaccines. I have to say that uh, uh, the Commission, the European Commission, uh, is uh, late in everything because you were talking before about percentage and uh, uh, my numbers, they say that um, the World Health Organization said that in Africa, 
it's less than 5% of the population that is fully vaccinated. And also, four days ago, this new ACT Accelerator Strategy Plan was announced and sets out urgent actions to address over the next year the gap in access to COVID-19 tests, uh, treatments, vaccines, and personal uh, protective equipment in low- and middle-income countries. So, um, this is something that we are dealing as well in a European level, but the European Parliament always push and press the European Commission to work intensively in securing more vaccines for Africa and also to reinforce dialogue with uh, developing countries in order to gain the necessary knowledge on the challenges and difficulties these uh, countries face in uh, producing vaccines and therefore to provide them with uh, needed means and tools for vaccine production in, in their territory. Because the truth is that the global efforts so far have fallen short. This is reflected um, in the enormous vaccination gap between higher income countries where vaccination has been completed for 50 to 60 percent of the population, while in other lower income areas, as I said before, is less than 5 uh, percent. So, um, I think we should uh, really try hard because if uh, nobody can be safe unless everybody's safe. Yeah. And al although the multilateral initiatives such as COVID and individual governments invest billions to expand pr uh, production plants, manufacturing capacity is far below what is needed. Um, and uh, only about a dozen uh, countries have the capacity to produce COVID-19 vaccines. Production capacity is a key barrier for vaccine availability. This is why we need more global cooperation to establish new production sites for COVID-19 vaccines and equipment. And of course, to increase the contribution to the COVAX initiative, which should be more ambitious. So, so. Uh, Elena, is Europe then, Europe is accepting it has a responsibility to make sure that regions like Africa, continents like Africa and, and other lower, uh, uh, lower income countries, they have the plants, they have the production plants to make their own vaccines. That is a, a, a European commitment? This is, no, no, this is the European Parliament that voted and asked for the and ask the demand and ask, I should say, the European Commission to accept that. Because right now it's uh, the COVAX uh, initiative to send the uh, vaccines to Africa. But what we said uh, and uh, what we demand, and as I told you, was uh, uh, an historical vote in the European Parliament, we asked from the EU for a firm decision awaiting intellectual property rights for coronavirus related products, including vaccines, at the World Trade Organization, aiming to address global production of the constraints and supply shortage. So we hope that they will listen to us because the European Parliament, since uh, the beginning of uh, the pandemic, we um, made a lot of uh, um, resolutions for even uh, the protocols, the health protocols. Um, we uh, create uh, the uh, uh, certificate that uh, uh, we can travel and facilitate traveling with this. We did a lot of things, but for some reason, the European Commission is still late to make decisions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Elena. Now, Talib, as I think somebody said before, you are worried that basically the world is not going to get back to full tourism for another four or five years because that's how long it will take, you think, for the vaccin vaccinations or vaccines to be available to everybody around the world. Is that, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. I think what Elena said is very correct. The EU is late, like every other country that's developed in this world because what we're talking about is travel and tourism. 
Travel and tourism connects people together. You can't have part of the world vaccinated and another part not vaccinated. Mm. Everybody has to be vaccinated. At this rate, it will take us five years to vaccinate 70% of the people of the world, which is something we can't wait for. Now, vaccination, as Dennis said, is not a cure. Vaccination is a protection. It delays some serious effect. So we have to work on vaccination. But I don't think that travel and tourism should depend on vaccination, 100%. Because it turns us into a game to those that have it, to those that don't have it. We don't want that game at all. What we want is testing. I think testing is by far much more reasonable, as Dennis said. If we make it affordable, if we make it cheaper, make it more, more available, then we could start traveling at least to places. Because vaccination now <coughs> is not the solution. But if we need to work on vaccination, without doubt. As Elena said, the European Union bears a responsibility. So that the United States, which is not united anymore, the divided states of America. Now, governments have to work together to achieve this goal. They have to. There is no other way. But the only way to do it is to bring the leaders of the world to one room and tell them, you're not leaving this room until you agree on one thing, one protocol. That protocol must be about testing to travel from one place to another. Because if testing is done the right way, we will at least have people move in a safer mood. We will have to work on vaccination, yes. But don't make it a condition for travel. Because mm. you can't, everybody will be a, lose, a loser. There are countries that are vaccinated and countries less than 5% five, 5 vaccinated. It's not going to work. Europeans want to go to Africa. Africa is now being spurred by divine proportion, by divine virtue. It's been spurred the, the thrust of COVID. But it will get COVID once people start coming from the, from countries to Africa. Once Africans start traveling abroad, this is the nature of travel. It connects people and places together. We're talking about travel now, We're not talking about other things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've got some strange t um, sounds coming from. I don't know what that's from. If anyone from the technical side can sort that out. Um, in terms, Dennis, then of of pharmaceutical companies getting involved in setting up plants in different countries. What, 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 are, what are the issues there? Are there any issues? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think we've heard from Elena, they've heard from Talib, and <clears throat> we've heard from Cuthbert. I, I think my, my take on it is that it, it is actually not trivial to set up a plant within a, um, any country. And, and as we've heard, there's five or six uh, around the world that can do it properly. And even some of those are not doing it as well. And, and you could, the, there, there are variances in the quality of the virus, uh, or the vaccine, I should say. So we've got that as a start. Talib makes a very good point, is that we really cannot be at this stage discriminating against countries that are too poor to actually have vaccination programs which are high enough to, and, and thus prevent those countries traveling. I mean, it's the British system that we've had, which was the red list and we red listed countries. And then we didn't, we, so we did that based on science. And then we forgot science because we, we never came to the experts such as our company, for example, we know that if you don't have COVID after five days, you aren't going to get it after you've, you've traveled, been whatever. So having people stay quarantined for 10 days is, is over the top, it's un unnecessary. But that's the kind of thing, and the number of times when we've been testing through Heathrow, Gatwick and whatever, we look at these hotels where the visitors from red list countries, and it's, it's like a concentration, they're actually behind a fence. And um, they're, for me, they're just waiting for the next person to come in that's not been tested properly to infect them, and then they're all going to get infected and it's going to be an absolute nightmare. So I, I would really think we need to, we need to you know, this whole COVID experience has been one where I don't think the world's done particularly well at at all. And I think it, there's, there's so many things involved. I mean, there's politics involved, there's public opinion involved, and then there's a science. That's an interesting little thing that, that we forget about. Public health is, is not just a science, it's also the public acceptance of all of this stuff. You know, that's whether we're vaccinating enough people, whether we do what they do in the United States and force people to get vaccinated, which is another thing we could argue. Or then, as Talib's saying, whether we discriminate against those who, for reasons 
you know, and we don't need to understand the reasons, but they don't want to be vaccinated. We have to allow them to be tested out of that scenario. And that's what we've always, um, you know, advocated. We've also advocated, and even although we're a testing company, we've advocated that there's no point in keeping people and testing them at day eight. Let's get them out and get them around. If they're, if they're negative at day two, day, day four, that's good enough for us uh, from coming in. Now, I, I think, you know, getting back to Rajan, your point is, your question is, that, uh, is there technology in, in the African countries? Yes, because all of these companies can transport. Is that cost effective and economical? Well, really, that's a question for the companies. They can set up plants all around the world. They can set up the distribution facilities easily enough. It's whether they would want to, um, you know, take it. That's a, a question for them. But I do think, you know, this is important from Cuthbert's um, point of view and, and, and from, from all of our points of view, is that I do think we can get the vaccinations uh, out there and uh, vaccines out there so that we can actually vaccinate. And then the, the issues are always going to be economics at the end of the day. Who pays for that? Uh, do we just give it to uh, other countries or do we give it to them for nominal? I certainly don't think we should be holding them hard and fast on patents. I think, that's a, the, I think these vaccination companies and the testing companies have made a lot of money from this, uh, this whole thing. And I'm talking about our own company as well. And what we're attempting to do is to give something back. But I think the vaccination uh, companies have made a tremendous amount of money. And I think morally that they have something more to do uh, I think some of them have, uh, have actually been very supportive of uh, third world countries and done their best. Others have not. Others have not reduced the, the price of the vaccine sufficiently. Um, and again, there's a, they've got to ask themselves, is that the right thing to do? I think uh, certainly the EU can do a lot with that because they can look at these players and actually um, tax them accordingly. And uh, let, that way. Let me go to uh, Elena then. Can, is that something that's happening? Can, can can the EU go for the pharmaceutical companies that are not being cooperative in terms of lowering their prices or whatever and, and their patents? Can you do something about that? Well, the truth is that we asked for, we asked for transparency and we asked for, uh, you know, uh, to be able to reduce also the, um, uh, the prices that uh, the, the patterns is very important to be able, uh, as we vote in the, this historical resolution, to, to to be able more companies to produce vaccination. But let me say something. Vaccination is the most important tool right now, but alone is not enough to put an end to this pandemic. This is why we need at the same time other production uh, measures to remain in uh, place, such as the use of masks, social distancing, also extensive testing. As uh, Dr. Talib Rufai said, we have to have uh, uh, testing, PCR tests, uh, while traveling, and uh, uh, access to treatment, you know, the monoclons, what is happening with the treatment, why everybody is, uh, you know, uh, focusing only in vaccination, we need to, uh, of course, uh, introduce the vaccine globally, but we need also to have, to have access to treatments uh, and also uh, strong health systems to contain the, the spread of the virus and minimize its impact. It's very important uh, for uh, the government make sure that we will have also from um, uh, health um, uh, infrastructure. And uh, also, I think that we should focus also uh, at uh, the cure, the models for them, why uh, is not already uh, produced enough. What they say too expensive. So there are a lot of things that we should uh, uh, talk about. And um, what I said about the strong health system, I want to point that because um, I heard before that the pandemic uh, we have to learn with, to live with, and uh, should. Um, all the governments and the local authorities implement holistic strategy and following a consultation with uh, everybody 
because we're talking about uh, transportation and tourism, uh, we have to gain the trust of the people to get vaccinated and to make sure that uh, uh, they will be, um, how can I say, accepting that uh, the next few years, uh, the, most of the people they say about uh, 2024 or even later we will recover. So, full recovery is clearly delayed. Uh, not, not only uh, by the ongoing pandemic and tourism, but uh, because also the lack of fewer uh, controls and protocols. So yeah. I think it, it's it's um, um, a lot of things that we have to uh, take care of to make sure that we will be safe. Thank you. Um, Cuthbert, in, I'll come to you in a second. Uh, um, Cuthbert, in terms of coordination between African countries as to protocols and as to what testing should be done on frontline staff, and I mean, when I say frontline staff, I mean people working in hotels or whatever. Is that something that's, be, that's, that's being done at the moment? Yes, it has been uh, really appreciated. May I then hasten to indicate that, uh, look, sitting in Africa, in the African continent, we really need a degree of appreciation of your modern technology and also our indigenous Methodies, I mean, that has been used for ages and ages. When you look at the impact of COVID-19, Africa has been spared simply because they've been using their indigenous methods. And that should be appreciated. Work with the more technology so that you can help them. I get worried when we look at the body that is going around. Yes, Dr. indicated that look, it's, it, it's our human right, and no one should be able to stay or to travel because of it. When you travel, it's obvious that go through the whereby you get trust. So that must be acknowledged and appreciated. Yet, the challenges we have, as I indicated from the offset, that we haven't seen a well coordinated approach from the policy makers, from the governments in Africa, they are working in silos. Each does his what he feels is best for his economy. And we, we, we meet a lot of opportunity that can assist in our recovery in Africa, both economic and also with the tourism state. So with the potential high interest from the continents as I of each threat, the need for more comprehensive and more well balanced all ancient response strategy. That will then mean my negative impact. So please to say even to the European Union, it is high time for us to start appreciating one another. Africa is not isolated island somewhere in the middle of Norway. It is part of our global community. So our efforts, our getting factors should take that in effect. You try to solve a problem that involves in the global community, but you are pushing it somewhere at the far corner. At the end of the day, it will definitely catch up with you. Okay. So we need to start appreciating Thank you. Um, Taleb, sorry, you, you were going to say something before. Yes, I just want to say that Casper is absolutely correct. We can't treat this world as two worlds, those that have it and those that don't have it. We're talking about travel and tourism here. Travel means that you, you have to travel to anywhere in the world. You can't discriminate against countries. You can't discriminate against Africa. You can't have people not go to Africa because Africa is not vaccinated. So people are not going to travel just because their governments tell them you can travel now. They want to travel with a peace of mind. Yeah. So there are many ways of doing that. Vaccination is one way, but the other way is testing. And the third way is insurance also. You know, if you, for example, like Jamaica is doing, Jamaica adopted a system called Jamaica Cares, 
which is an insurance policy they buy when they come to Jamaica. I think it's $40, isn't so it? It's $10 only. Yeah, uh, ten, right, okay, $10. Yeah, yeah. That insurance policy will guarantee you to be treated or expatriated to your country if you want. People will have the peace of mind. That's when people will start to travel. Because without the world opening up to each other, without it being a fair world, people are not going to travel. People are not going to travel just from Germany to France or to Italy or to Spain. Yeah. They, this, is not, this is not what tourism is all about. Yeah. That's what Thank I'm you. Saying. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time. Last, my last point um, to you, Dennis, which, which is there's so much uncertainty here, isn't there? Just, we, I mean, you can tell that travel is not back to 100%. I mean, I've, I've been told that, for instance, here at WTN, it's not actually completely full because there's uncertainty. Um, that will carry on. Now, the, the worst scenario, the worst case scenario is it just goes on and on, and we get variants coming in, and, and, and that c c continues to cause problems. Boosters carry on if we don't find the cure, and that feels like a long way off. Perhaps you can enlighten me on that. But in terms of how you see this moving on, this going forward, and perhaps just give me your honest view. Where do you see it going and what will be the impact on travel and tourism? You know, it's very funny, um, and thanks for the question, Rajan, but I, right from the start and even before the whole COVID, I've been on the, the, the media, television, whatever, and I've always been asked this, and I've always given a very optimistic um, story. I've always said, you know, right, I think, 18 months ago, I said, it'll be over in three months, you know? <laughs> and then, then, then I extended it a little bit longer, and I said, you know, uh, you know, in three months' time, I said, oh, it's going to be another three months, and then it was another six months, and now it's another nine months. So you, I'm probably the worst person to be asked that question. You, know? <laughs> you work in the business, though. <laughs> I work in the business. This is, and I know an awful lot about this, this disease. This disease is both an immunological and what we call an innate immune disease. The spike protein actually hammers your inflammatory system. The immune effects actually hammer your immune system. It's one of those diseases, it's almost the perfect storm in terms of a, of a disease. It's massively contagious, it spreads, it evades the, the vaccine, can you believe it? So we, we end up having a wane in the immune status after uh, something like 90 days, um, we, we talk about 180s, we, we give it, say, for th uh, three months, six months, six months, we, we then, our vaccines aren't valid, all our certificates that we carry, the QR codes, we're going to have to need a booster in order, to, if, if we go the way we're going. So when you ask me, uh, I, I could tell you biologically, Rajan, mm. I could mm. tell you biologically what will happen with coronavirus, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is it will go the way of all other coronaviruses. That is, it will become endemic, it will become part of our seasonal flu, and we'll have the vaccination and we'll do all the rest of it, and it will come back every, every season and uh, we'll get on top of it. That's what I could tell you, or I could tell you, I, really, I could be honest and tell you I really do not know but I'll tell you something else, Cuthbert, and, and be very careful with, uh, you know, Africa. Um, Africa, you know, many, we've heard lots of stories. The Russians thought they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know didn't, weren't going to get COVID, and they started giving their PPE away and everything like that. We've seen lots of countries. Modi, for, for, his, for his, uh, you know, one, one guy was thinking, oh, India spared of it, and then absolutely hammered with COVID. So, you know, there but by the grace of God go you, because uh, we do not know enough about this disease. So, but I'll try to give you an, an answer. I think we're going to continue to have vaccination levels and infection levels, which are both going to give us immunity. So very few of us will die. Our infection rates will actually, or our contagion rates, our contagion ability will reduce as we go. Um, but we're still going to have pockets in different parts of the world, such as, for example, New Zealand. So they, they have not had any great, uh, you know, experience of COVID. And they're just sitting there waiting for their industries to start. But when they do start, you know, I've got news for you. You're going to get COVID, whatever happens. So I think you, we've got to continue to be surveying about this. You know, people are asking you, asking us, when are we going to have to stop testing at Heathrow and all the rest of it? I'm saying, when did we stop testing for liquids and luggage after the shoe bombers and all the rest of it? It's now been 18, 20 years since all of that. So I honestly, Rajan, I'll be very honest. I've been wrong every time, okay? So, but if you want me to, to say something, I would say that we're going to have to continue with the vaccine, and we're going to have to continue with the testing, and we're going to have to continue. As Elena said perfectly, 
We're going to have to do the simple things. Wear a mask all the time. Everybody in the subway, everybody underground, everybody in the train should be wear a mask. Boris is, is, is playing the typical liberal and, and saying, OK, let's, you know, let's loosen up a little bit. You've got to be joking. We, in, in Signpost, we've been seeing a, a large rise. Now, albeit we're all vaccinated by and large, so none of us are dying, but we're still carrying on with this uh, vaccine, uh, sorry, this virus, and we're still carrying on with the epidemic. I'm sorry for going on too long. Yeah. I know you've got to stop me. OK, yeah. and at that point, we have to, to end. Um, Elena, thank you so much for joining us. Cuthbert, thank you too. Um, from the separate continents there, uh, Taleb and Dennis, thanks very much indeed. Thank you.